you're watching the press preview, a first look at what is on the front pages as they arrive. It's time to see what is making headlines with our defence and security analyst, Professor Michael Clark, as well as the Daily Mirror's political editor, John Stevens, and the Daily Mail columnist, Sarah Vine. We'll hear from them in just a moment. But first, let's take a look at some of those front pages, all dominated by that plane crash involving Evgeny Prigozhin. This is the headline of the eye. Putin critic killed 60 days after mutiny. The Financial Times also carries confirmation that Prigozhin died in the crash. The Guardian says that the Wagner chief is reported dead. The Daily Mail asks whether the crash was an act of revenge by Putin, while the Express also suggests the crash was a result of Prigozhin's attempted mutiny, calling it no surprise. The Daily Star also appears sceptical that the crash was an accident, with the headline, What Rotten Luck. Well, the Metro has India over the moon as they've become the fourth nation to make a lunar landing. And a reminder, by scanning the QR code you see on screen during the programme, you can check out the front pages of the papers while you watch along with us. Now, tonight, as I said, we're joined by Professor Michael Clark, John Stevens, and Sarah Vine, and there they all are. Guys, it's great to have you all in the studio. And as one story, of course, dominating. Let's start with the front of the ice, Sarah, and uh, that shot there of Prigozhin, yes. uh, purportedly taken when he was in Africa just a couple of days ago. Well, that's what... That, that's what. Well, I was just asking Michael, who knows everything about the story, and he said that they weren't really sure that he was in Africa, and you thought that he probably was wearing too many clothes for a man who was supposedly standing <laughs> he was around... 50 degrees. So 50 so degrees. So very overdressed. Yes, he's slightly overdressed for the occasion. I've never seen a commander wear that sort of com uh, yeah. camo outfit in that sort of heat. And also, he doesn't seem to be sweating at all, so maybe it was... Africa, yeah, yeah. Um, but yes, I mean, we, but, but but I mean, already we don't really know what's happened. No. Or, you know, he's on the flight list. He was on the flight list. There were two aeroplanes. One of them has come down. He was on the flight list with his deputy. Mm. See, I think looking, yeah. I think that's a bit fishy because I think if you're in, if you're Mr. Warlord, you don't travel with your deputy, do you? Because what happens if the plane goes down? You're both dead. Absolutely. I mean, Michael, is that right? Would you travel yeah. in separate planes? I mean, the interesting thing as well is that they said ten were on board yeah. and recovered eight bodies, which yeah. leaves yeah. two. Yeah. I mean, you know, this story will, will just keep rolling for a couple of days. More and more details will come out. And so the papers are going with what they've got, which is, you know, all that we know is that aircraft come down, he's identified as being dead, Udkin seems to be dead. Uh, the uh, Wagner channels are saying Udkin's dead as well, he's the deputy. If so, the, I mean, the world will be glad to see the back of these two people, but, you know, the issue goes on. Yeah, it certainly does. And, and John, I suppose that the, the question now is what sort of impact this actually ends up having on the war and, and on the, the Wagner mercenary group. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to see that it's going to make a massive difference to the war. And it's perhaps... Well, it's definitely not a surprise that he's died. You know, here, you know, on the front page of the eye, it's all about killed 60 days after that mutiny. Mm. I think the surprise is that he somehow managed to last 60 days, that Putin hesitated. But how on earth, he thought, after escaping Russia, going off to exile in Belarus and then maybe going to Africa, why on earth he thought, oh, well, I'll just pop back to Russia, it'll be absolutely fine. We're, we're over it, you know, Putin won't mind, you know, we're friends again now. Why on earth you do that and why you would get on a private well, plane, uh, goodness knows. Uh, well, it's his jet, and Michael was saying he's been back and forth on that plane plenty of times. So, between Petersburg and Moscow, yeah. In, in a way, you know, you say, why would you do this so casually? In a way, you're riding a tiger. You know, once once he, he crossed the line with, with uh, criticisms of the Kremlin and criticisms of Gerasimov and Shogu, um, once he'd, he'd engaged in this armed rebellion, you're riding the tiger then. You can't step off it, so you've got to keep going. And, uh, you know, he may well have had uh, intimations of what was, what was going to happen, but the, he has no alternative. You know, you, you don't give yourself a way out when you go in, in on his career path. I mean, I suppose there are two options. Either Putin's decided to kill him, uh, or he's decided to pretend that he's dead so that he can go and start a new life in Brazil or somewhere. In which case, we won't hear from him for I mean, a very long time. But both are quite good books. No, it'll be like... Oh, fantastic. It'll be like... <laughs> great stories. You know, he'd be turning up on the front, on the front of the sun, yeah. you know, every, once every three years in Australia on the beach. <laughs> Copacabana in his yeah, shorts. Exactly. Yeah. We've seen like Prigozhin, you know. It'd be like Lord Lucan all over again. <laughs> Absolutely. It? It, really, it really could. I mean, and, and the, sort of the fascinating thing as well about this is, well, you know, the, the coup was one thing, but as Michael said, he was making a lot of noise and a lot of trouble, saying all the wrong things yeah. for weeks and months before that he actually led that abortive coup. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, his, his story is extraordinary. He was a hot dog salesman, wasn't he? Mm. He, he was sort of... Beauty, he was a caterer, yeah, a caterer. But he was, a, he was an entrepreneur as well. He ran all yeah. sorts of businesses. He yeah. just had an eye for business. Yeah. And, of course, in Petersburg, the eye for business meant that you were also a petty criminal and you yeah. worked with the gangs. And time and inside, he, he was in yeah. prison for a number of years. He was very successful, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. Um, and he is a fascinating character, as you say, and it uh, does remain to be seen exactly where and if he pops up again. But I suppose the, the question is what this means now for the Kremlin and, and how they decide that they're going to take this forward. Yeah, and obviously Putin's decided to get rid of him now or it looks like Putin's decided to get rid of him now. But back in the early days of that coup, when he was marching on Russia, when he was marching on Moscow and those tanks were on their way up and we were all following it on Google Maps or whatever, it seemed like Putin was really scared of him, that he appeared on TV, did that broadcast, was talking about how Russia was at risk. That is not something that somebody who is in total control and everything is going fine does. That showed that Putin was panicked. Obviously, somehow they did this deal and it's absolutely gone wrong for him. It yeah. was said that on that evening of the 24th of June that Putin hopped off with the Kovalchuk brothers, who were the two, his two friends, the banker and uh, that look after him, and that he went to their place because he didn't want to stay where he was. That may not be true. But, but the rumours that Putin would not stay in the Kremlin while this march was going on were rife at the yeah. time. And the fact that those, the fact that those rumours got around shows you how much credibility Putin was losing mm. at that, that end of June because of everything that had happened with this man, Prigozhin. Do you think this restores Putin's credibility or makes him more vulnerable? I think ultimately it'll make him more vulnerable. Yeah. It might restore a certain amount of sort of mafia Bravado, credibility. This is the yeah. godfather yeah. Yeah. striking back. But ultimately it just confirms the gangster state nature of the way Russia is. I mean, and, and, and again, I mean, Putin is riding a tiger as well. He can't get off. Yeah. I mean, once you commit yourselves to these sorts of courses of action, you've got to keep on forward. You've mm. got to go to meet your, your destiny. He presents himself as a tough guy for his supporters, but of course the Wagner supporters are very, very upset with, with what has happened. Let's look at the front of The Guardian and, and one of the images of the, um, of the burning wreckage. There it is. Uh, uh, and you know, we're never actually going to know the truth of what, what has happened here, are we? You know, because this has all come from Russian news agencies. These mm. are Russian-supplied pictures, and I'm not suggesting for any moment that it's been staged, but it's, it's difficult to know exactly what has taken place. And it's all come out very quickly. So that footage you, you were showing on Sky earlier, that's handheld footage taken on a farm somewhere that happened to be in the right place at the right Just time. happened to see a tiny little plane. Got the mobile phone out, got <laughs> filming, and suddenly <laughs> it somehow got out there very, very yeah. quickly. And it was obviously the Russian news agency was the first to be out there and say, this mm -hmm. plane has crashed. He was there on the flight logs. And I think that will create this suspicion that Russia clearly has got a storyline marked out for this. Mm. And whether they now go on to say, oh, this was Ukraine's fault, whether they continue to kind of mm. make it look like it was them, who knows? And some of the video footage that I saw earlier on today actually had dead bodies in it. So it's pretty gruesome, mm. which they will have done in order to make sure that it goes viral, which presumably it will have done. Mm. I mean, it's all quite, it's, it feels quite engineered. It does feel engineered yeah. a little bit, doesn't it? But that's all part of the misinformation, isn't it? Because we're, we're, we're not meant to be able to see behind the curtains. It's meant to be opaque. It's meant to feel like... Yeah. Are they telling us the truth? The, the, I mean, the, the Russians always have the, the standard way of dealing with all these things, um, which is that w when something happens, like the uh, uh, MH17 uh, aircraft that was brought down over the Donbass in 2014, they first of all, they just deny it outright, say it hasn't happened, it didn't happen. And then after 24 hours, they say, well, lots of complications. It's, uh, it was very complicated. And they, they draw red herrings across it all. Oh. And then after about six or eight months, they say, yeah, we did it, we did it. But you do exactly the same in the West. There's moral equivalence between us. And they always go there, you know, denial, complication, and then moral equivalent admission. And we're going to see probably something like yeah. that pr pattern with this. But the first, the, the first few things we hear from the Kremlin or from Russian agencies, I mean, you know, take it with a huge pinch of salt. Wait, wait until we've got some verification from our own press and mm. our own officials um, who can sort of triangulate some of this material and confirm or deny what we're going to be told from Moscow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's important to be able to try and get And just the drama of it all tonight with Putin there at that concert on stage. He wasn't hiding away, he was there. I mean, that is something from a TV drama. Oh, you could just imagine the violin starting up, the music getting all orchest orchestral, and then you kind of... Change I mean, scenes like of the plane yeah. tumbling from the it's sky. It's the of Kursk as well. It's a hugely yeah. symbolic moment yeah. in Russian history. You know, it's yeah. a huge tank battle on the, the planes just outside Ukraine that he was there to mark. Let's look at the front page of the FT and against that picture of Prigozhin uh, there in his uh, fatigues. May or may not have been in, um, in Africa. Uh, and much of the reporting in here, Michael, is, is what you were just saying that it's going to take a while for them to try and make sure, just to verify exactly. Uh, what took place here? Yes. Um, I mean, we're hearing tonight as well that uh, the Wagner Group, the command structure, are going to be making some statements. Mm. They won't be very pro-Ministry uh, of Defence statements. Moscow's Ministry of Defence, we're pretty sure. But they will be coming out with something. 
uh, in the next few hours, and I think that, that'll probably make tomorrow night's uh, headlines, whatever they mm. choose to say about <clears throat> the future of the Wagner Group or the way they interpret all of this. But they seem to be clear in the last few hours that this is a, a strike from the Russian MOD. This is an assassination on their leaders by the official uh, Russian military and that they will be reacting to that in some way. I, mean, I suppose the question will be what the Wagner Group chooses to do, as we've been saying all evening. Many of them are in Belarus, but, of course, back on the 24th of June, some 5,000 of them led a column up towards Moscow. So there is... It's an open question as to actually how they, they may well react. Yeah, it seems like it's a full-on purge that's underway. They've got this... Russian army chief, who I'm not even trying to pronounce his Slavikin. name, but known as the General Armageddon, yeah. who also who oh, was Slavikin, kind of yeah. relieved of his duties today as well. So it feels very much that this was all one planned thing to show that Putin's back in control. Yeah, and Slavikin and Prigozhin are, are known to be close allies. I mean, there is sort of... A, a, we must not forget that there's a war being prosecuted here and some 500,000 yeah. people have died, but yeah. it does feel very much like yeah. moving people around. Kamali, they were good friends. They, they were good friends because uh, Prigozhin saved Sorovikin's bacon in Syria years ago. Sorovikin made a big mistake when he was in command and Prigozhin took the, took the blame for it. Right. He, I mean, he owed him. And they were, they were close. Uh, and, yeah, and, and Sorovikin almost certainly knew something was happening when this coup, this attempted coup, was taking place. And he didn't do anything about it. He just kept he just quiet. Kept quiet. He had some advanced knowledge, maybe a couple of days, maybe more, mm. and he just sat on it to see what would happen. And that's been his, that's been his downfall because the Kremlin just doesn't believe that he's, he's um, on their side. So you picked something out of the FT or should we move on to the Express? No. Let's, let's move on, on to the Express, because I just, I just want to just... Uh, pick up with you, Sarah, about you know the sort of the court politics of all of this as well, because there is a lot of moving around of these kind of senior figures with all yeah, very I, difficult. I, I mean, like I said, it, it, I mean, who knows? I mean, I, I don't. Will this mean the end of the Wagner Group? No, they'll no. presumably just. <clears throat> no, no. You know, I mean, they've got huge interests, and yeah. they uh, they're earning so much money in yeah. Africa, and they're so involved in Libya and Mali and uh, Ethiopia now. And you were telling uh, me earlier, Michael, they're not the only PMC private. No, military no, no there's twenty operating. odd, twenty five um, private military companies yeah. of, uh, of uh, mercenaries running around in Ukraine. Yeah. So the, the group will disperse, I'm sure, but the Wagner brand is now a universal yeah, brand. Yeah, and, and I just, going. I feel very sorry for the people of Ukraine because, you know, these people are running around waving their, I can't say it on the television, can I? Waving their watsits around. You can't say that. Um, uh, uh, and, you know, being generally sort of obnoxious. And, and meanwhile, all these people are dying in this terrible war that is illegal and shouldn't be happening. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a really difficult situation, but um, we will find out perhaps the truth of what did happen just outside Moscow in that plane crash. All right, guys, for now, thank you very much for that. Plenty more to come. Uh, there's been criticism of the uh, severance package that's been offered to the former chief exec of NatWest, who resigned over the controversy around Nigel Farage's banking affairs, and uh, we'll discuss that next. Hello there, and welcome back. You're watching the Press Preview with us to discuss the morning's newspapers of the Professor Michael Clark, the Metro, Sarah, which, uh, as we were saying just before we came back, this would have been the lead story, I'm sure, yeah. had Prigozhin's plane not gone down. India, only the fourth nation to land something on the moon. Yes, it looks a bit like a Meccano toy from the photograph on the front page, but it is apparently <laughs> a very technical thing, and it's actually a, a triumph for, for sort of moon technology. But Michael is the person who really knows about this because he was explaining <laughs> it to me earlier. Right? Oh, Michael, tell so us. I really am going to have it's to defer to him. the Vikram correct? Yeah. Uh, and it's... Uh, in a lot of... I mean, the Indians had failed before with the previous attempt. The Japanese had failed, uh, the Israelis had failed and the Russians had failed. And so they succeeded with this one. And the point is the south pole of the moon is really important mm -hmm. because there may be water there, water ice, and there's abundant sunshine. So that's the basis for a moon base. And any exploration of the solar system would have to be from a moon base. So that, to, to, get a, to get something on the south pole of the moon is first base in the exploration. And they've done it. Yeah. Other people couldn't. So scientifically, this is big news. This is and, really big news. And it must be... It's a huge thing for India after... Absolutely. ...of all the nations on Earth to be able to do this right. first, right? And they're, they're, they're now the biggest country in the world. I mean, they overtook this, this year. They officially overtook China in terms of population. They've succeeded this week where the Russians failed last week. Mm. I mean, I, I dislike mm. Hendra Modri intensely on a number of grounds, but I give him today. I give him... You know, I say he's allowed today to be as triumphalist as he likes because this is a great achievement. Yeah. And it's, a, it's an achievement for, for world science. Mm. And, and, you know, I, I support that absolutely. 100% absolutely. take that point. But, I mean, the cost of it is Yes, is there immense. has been some criticism because, I mean, India doesn't exactly have... You know, it has quite a lot of problems. Uh, <laughs> and an enormous amount say. of poverty. Yeah. And uh, uh, so, you know, it's, I suppose it's a question of priorities.
Yeah. I mean, but the prestige, I guess, John, of being able to land on the moon, I don't think, as Michael said, Narendra Modi is going to care that much about those criticisms at the moment. No, and obviously we know that this is an advancement, as Michael was saying, about how no one has landed in this area before. We know that obviously it's the fourth time that someone's landed on the moon, but it's the first time they've landed in this particular area. We know the scientific importance that Michael was saying beforehand about how it's so tricky to land there. That yeah. The other side of the moon where we've landed before, it's flat, it's much easier yeah. to kind of yeah, land like the Himalayas. Them down. South, South Pole of the Moon. It's like landing something in the middle of the Himalayas. Mm. Really tough. And yeah, they did a excellent work. Uh, well done to India. Let's move on now to a story that's inside the Times. And again, a story that I think may well have been dominating the front pages for Bogosian's plane not go, gone down. And this, uh, we can see it there, Rudy Giuliani, former mayor of New York, uh, Trump's lawyer has now been um, uh, indicted in Georgia. His mugshot has been taken, but as you can see from the headline there, sir, he's saying he's doing it for America. Yes, I mean that's Trump is saying a sort of similar thing, isn't he? I mean it's it's just sort of. Have you worked out the crazy oh, yeah. theatre that yeah. seems to be going on? I mean because I think I think Trump. So really sort of under Trump's umbrella, and although there's those supporters, the, the, the more trouble they seem to get in, the more they love him. So mm. it's like he, the, he's, turned, he, you know, he's this sort of messiah, he's this martyr, he's this, you know, he can do no wrong. So it's, 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 it sort of feels a bit like it's almost making it better for Trump. Well, yeah. every time yeah. that he's indicted, he's his, his poll numbers go up and he raises more exactly. money. Exactly, you know, so it's like... And I think the same is probably true of Giuliani. I mean, his supporters... He was mayor of New York. He cleaned up New York. He was very sort of tough and all that kind of. I mean, they, you know, I don't, I don't think they. I think they'll just see him as a sort of hero. It's not a split screen moment. We've obviously got this on one side, and on the other side, you've got the Republican contenders, mm. apart from Trump, taking part in this first Fox News mm. debate. Mm -hmm. And obviously, it's so hard to kind of get attention when you're up against Trump. He sucks the oxygen mm. out of everything. And this is going to happen exactly again. You look at all of their poll numbers. They're all going to be standing there at the podiums desperately trying to say anything that might get some attention. And you know that all the attention will be on Donald Trump and whatever happens to him tomorrow when he goes to that courthouse. But the fascinating thing is they can't say anything too critical because they don't want to yeah. upset the Trump base. And also, perhaps they want to get on the ticket with him eventually. And, and, and Trump and Giuliani, I mean, it's interesting, they double down, you know, in, on these court cases. Because you know, over the years, all, all candidates for the presidency claim to be outsiders. They claim to be uh, outsiders to the Washington institutions. Mm -hmm. But these guys are claiming to be outsiders to all of America's institutions. Yeah. You know, the, the whole, this whole Republican base is an attack on all of the institutions of America. They just don't believe in it anymore. And so, in a way, it's, it, what you've got is a sort of political move which says all the institutions which, which oppose us are somehow illegitimate. Yeah. So America is really dangerous. It's a very, very dangerous place. place. Also, I always think of Giuliani as a sort of almost a precursor to Trump. Yeah. Because mm. he was doing the Trump shtick yeah. before Trump was doing the Trump shtick. You know, he was the kind of tough guy, the maverick, the, you know, I'm going to, I don't care, I'm not going to put up with any of your namby-pamby nonsense. And he was doing that. And, and, and so, so it sort of feels that that's just, that's his, you know, that's his USP, isn't yeah. it? And so this just plays into it, really, it to be honest. It certainly does. All right. Plenty more on that uh, later on. But let's look at CTM, because we haven't got loads of time left. Uh, and this is a, a story that um, has taken a, a turn that I perhaps wasn't oh, expecting, yeah. but I maybe should have done. Uh, and this is uh, the boss of NatWest, who is, uh, of course, who stood down after that uh, Ferrari with Nigel Farage. Uh, and, John, um, she's taking a £2.4 million. Mm, <laughs> poor thing. I mean, it must be awful Whoops. for her. <laughs> I think if I ever lose my job and ended up by £2.4 million to pay out, I would be very <laughs> delighted. <laughs> Take me now. Um, but obviously, the reason why it is such a big number is because this is basically 12 months notice. Mm. When you add in a salary and a mm. pension, you get to this incredible number. But obviously, after what happened and that ridiculous row where she was very embarrassed, leaking that story, and then her explanation didn't add up at all, you think she's done very well to get any money at all. I mean, it just reminds you how much these bankers really get oh, paid. Yeah. I mean, they just do get paid stratospheric amounts of money, don't they? And that's it. You and, know, uh, we're doing the I'm wrong sure, thing. Yeah, well, I'm, sure that, yeah. I'm sure that she's worth it. <laughs> Professor Clark, John, and Sarah, thank you very much. More from you guys in the next hour.